Hello again. This fantastic creature is a lesser Galago, which in my professional scientific opinion is probably the cutest small furry animal on earth. No exceptions. It makes me want to pack up and move to South Africa just to be closer to one. They are not particularly rare in South Africa, being quite common and widespread. Today's is the second programme to come from South Africa. My guest is Karen Lawrence, founder and director of the Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital. Next week, we will continue with the veterinary theme, talking with Brazilian vet Dr. Flavia Seher Shiniki about her work doing cat and dog ultrasound in Brazil. But back to today. Dr. Lawrence works exclusively with wildlife. She works for a non-profit organisation. Indeed, she is the founder of it. The organisation she runs survives exclusively on donations and faces many day-to-day -day challenges in modern South Africa. Challenges we'll hear about later in the interview. She talks about her connection with native, smaller species of South African fauna and the rarest animal that she has to deal with, which is the ground pangolin, also known as Temminx pangolin cape or step pangolin. I began by asking her what it takes to become a specialist wildlife vet in South Africa. I must say it took me about 20 years, <laughs> but it's not because I wanted to be a wildlife vet in the beginning. Um, I did small dogs and cats and exotics. And then one day I was working at a wildlife rehab center and we, really, we had small and medium wildlife. So I thought this looked more like something I wanted to do. And then I left my very steady, well-paying <laughs> small animal vet job. And I became a wildlife vet. So it's a lot of self-teaching because um, at our university in South Africa, they teach mostly the larger wildlife, like rhino and um, elephant and lion, all these types of things. But they don't do bats and owls and genets. So it was a lot of lot of self-teaching, um, a lot of reaching out to friends who do birds and who do reptiles. So eventually, well, I'm now about eight years in and I only do wildlife, nothing else. Why? My hospital where I work is a non-profit facility. So we work with animals that have no owners. So anything that you bring in, like an owl that's been hit by a car or a bat you found in your, in your house. So those animals don't have owners. So where do you take them? And how do they get treated? So we treat them um, free of charge. We work on donations for me. And then we can release. So I love working with wildlife especially because I don't have clients. I, 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 <laughs> it's nice. Um, and for me, the nice thing about small wildlife is I can do as much as I want to, whereas large wildlife is more of a herd health approach. So you treat the herd and don't really care about the individual mostly. But in, in small wildlife, you can fix a broken leg. You can fix a broken leg. You, know, you can treat the abscess. You can treat the disease. And then see the animal in front of you um, get better and you can release them. Because you're treating wildlife as opposed to companion animals like dogs and cats, is there slightly less pressure or are you still accountable to owners or guardians? No, definitely slightly less pressure. There is no one to tell me I can't do a test or I can't do this or I can't do that because there's no money. So thankfully, 
because of our donations, I get, get to make those decisions. Um, and the people, my staff and the people I work with. So, yes, definitely less stressful. What books or people or meetings have most influenced you? I would say people. Um, friends of mine who treat wildlife. Look, they did large wildlife, but they helped me a lot. Books as well, especially zoo and wildlife medicine. What threats, Karen, do the smaller species of wildlife face in South Africa? For me, it's it's um, people tend to be want to save or protect the larger wildlife more, like the iconic species, you know, like a whale or a polar bear or a lion, elephant, and they seem to forget about the little things, um, and especially little things that get uh, trafficked or poached. They're often overlooked. Um, I think they face almost a larger threat than the big ones because they are overlooked. Um, and also because they're in urban areas and people don't always want them. People don't want bats. People don't want, well, not all people, but people don't want owls either. And once we do the education and they understand that, then it's great. But like snakes also, they're dangerous. And we try to get people to phone us rather than kill them so we can remove them. But otherwise they do, unfortunately, um, they're harmed. Um, how did COVID affect things for you? Thankfully, we were one of the essential services. So we carried on through COVID. People were sitting at home and they did donate quite a bit. See, all our staff stayed. We could pay everybody. Um, the animals came in just as many, as much as, as before. How did you manage to learn things like um, anesthesia protocols for, for the different species? What was the most challenging for anesthetizing? For me, it's a tortoise, most likely. <laughs> so, because l- luckily mammals are, are mostly the same. So, all the mammals you do are very similar to dogs and cats. Bird ones are very similar, like to parrots and things. But reptiles are very different. Um, they, for instance, don't have a diaphragm. So, when they are anesthetic, you have to ventilate them. Otherwise, they can't breathe. Um, and sedating a tortoise is not as easy, especially when they don't want you to. <laughs> so, Getting them sedated is difficult, especially large tortoises, because we in South Africa get um, leopard tortoises that go up to 80, 90 years old, and they're enormous, they're 30, 40 kilos. And sedating one of those and ventilating one of those um, is a bit more tricky. And also venomous snakes, because we need someone to hold that snake when you inject it so it can be um, anesthetized, and then you put a tube in, the breathing tube that people get when they go. But again, the snake can't wake up because it will bite my... Um, my nurse or my nephetist. Presumably you're one of very few vets who are prepared to deal with venomous snakes. There are a few of us in South Africa. Thankfully, um, the herb vets or herb pathology vets, or as I call them, herb vets, or there are a, a few of us, but not many. Um, so yes, it's, it's. I would say in Gauteng, where I live, the province, probably about seven vets that would be able to do this. What's the most challenging species that you deal with? Is it the tortoise? No, I would say a pangolin. They are now the most poached mammal on the planet. And all the pangolins we get in are from the illegal wildlife trade. So they come in from a sting operation with the police and they confiscate it. And often they have been without food or water for anything between five days and four weeks. So by the time they get in, you can imagine all the health problems they have. They're also tricky because um, you can only work with them when they're anesthetized. Otherwise, they curl into a ball and you can get nowhere near anything important. Um, they also don't eat out of a bowl. So you can't give them, they only eat ants and So they won't eat things out of a bowl. We have to walk with them for four to six hours a day for them to forage and eat ants. So a lot of manpower. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. What's the level of local interest on the ground in treating wildlife karen i mean do people understand what you're about are veterinary students only too keen to help out a lot of people are interested um especially vet students we get a lot of vet students from overseas because obviously you cannot uh, we have a very big diversity of wildlife in south africa so most of them come um and they do large wildlife as well like a darting rhino, a darting lion, but um, a lot of them do then book with us as well and spend some time with us. We do, however, not just do what, um, veterinary stuff, we do the rehab bits as well. So we clean the cages, we feed the animals, we do cage enrichment, you know, we 
um, find release sites and all these fun things in between. Are there opportunities in South Africa for people to go on and specialize in wildlife veterinary medicine? There is. You can specialize at our university, the Faculty of Veterinary Science, but it's a more based on large wildlife. So there's no speciality field in the one that I do. Unfortunately, there are a lot of interesting students and foreigners, but because we're a non-profit facility, we cannot pay market-related salaries. Um, and we all earn less than we should, which is then quite a, a of putting, if I can put it that way. Um, because it is a lot of hard work, um, a long hour, and only the, the really, really passionate people really want to do this. Because it's fun to do it for two weeks, and then they all go home for four weeks. But long term, it's, it's a lot of hard work. What makes you continue, Karen, in the, in the long term and making a career out of it? If, it? if it's relatively poorly paid, and I can understand exactly where you're coming from on that point, why do we do it? I do it because of my ability then to see these animals come from a horrible whatever happened to them to be released again. Um, what makes my job also very unique is I get to testify in court for these animals. So anything like a chameleon that's been poached, I then testify in court as to how it was kept, its dehydration, its health status. Um, anything like that and that becomes almost like a superpower if I can call it that because I get to be the voice for that animal I would rather have less money and more job satisfaction than more money and the and all the stresses of coming with private practice I did private practice for 14 years so no I'm done if anybody's watching this and they're thinking of becoming a vet, what would you recommend? Private practice or looking for an NGO with wildlife as you do? I think start off with private practice because it teaches you all the basic skills. Um, because even though we don't work with clients, we still work with the public. And not all vets are very good with people. I'm terrible. So you you have to learn it. In 20 years, you have to learn how to speak to people, how to, how to approach them, how to talk to them about and an animal is going to be euthanized because it's broke its wing too badly. Or, and that's, those are difficult decisions. And I find also that anesthesia, um, medicine, how to treat things, uh, how to monitor anesthetic, how to recognize disease are better when you do small animals first. Because you have mentors that have been doing that, specialist mentors, um, like ultrasound, for example. I learned from working in private practice. So I can use that in my work now. But I would definitely start off as a small animal vet. What would you say to somebody thinking of becoming a vet? How can they develop their bedside manner? I I did a lot of waitressing when I was in varsity because then you learn to talk to people and you can't be nasty. And then I also worked at a um, cheetah rehabilitation centre where I took out um, tourists on a bus and explained things to them. So I think you can learn it. You don't have to be a very outgoing person but you can learn it and i think it's very important that people do that culturally karen in south africa what do vets want to do do they tend to want to work in mixed practice with livestock and companion animals or um qualify with all the skills so you can do small animal or production animals uh, mostly or a very little amount of exotic training sadly because there are more people with exotic pets nowadays so I think that field is going to explode. So I think most of the vets want to do small animals um, because nowadays women are a higher percentage in veterinary medicine. Um, and I think they need a bit more solid base, especially when they have a family. But there are a lot of people that, that I know, especially my friends, that do mixed practice. I wonder, Karen, when you talk about exotic animals, bearing in mind where you are, you're in South Africa, what, when you step out your door and see an animal, that to me is an exotic animal. To you, is it something that comes from Southeast Asia or North America? So things that, yeah, so exotic is anything that's not indigenous to South Africa. Is there a problem with the supply of snake anti-venom in South Africa? I cannot manufacture it at the moment, so the biggest thing is not to get bitten. Do you have to deal in South Africa with problems like... Uh, avian influenza and rabies but yes we have the same issues as you um and people also then have to 
euthanize masses of, of chickens, for example. It's even a bigger problem in South Africa because we have a lot of subsistence farmers, meaning you have your house with your 20 chickens that you keep and they're not closed. So all the birds, the wild birds can get to them. And what happens is often these people have pigs as well and they walk through the poo and then walk through somewhere else. And then that's how it spreads, which is very difficult to control. It's not um, all farmers only. Um, yes, rabies is a massive problem in South Africa. It's mostly stray dogs that are the problem. Um, so there's massive vaccine campaigns because people often die because of it. It's in certain areas more uh, common, but yes, it is a problem. Wow. Now we're all vaccinated against rabies. Um, all the vets in South Africa, um, well, and then all the staff that work at the hospital have to get vaccinated too, just in case. I wonder what's a bigger issue, Karen: uh, rabies or snake bites? Rabies. At least the snake bite is sort of treatable, hmm. even if you don't have any antivenom. Whereas the rabies, if you don't get treatment immediately, you will die. So it's yeah, it's a huge issue. And thankfully, only it's mostly a companion animal problem because. I don't have not seen a wildlife case with rabies, but I've seen when I was in private practice with companion animals, I saw two dogs with rabies. So it's more of a problem there than with wildlife. Is veterinary medicine uh, becoming uh, more popular? Is it very competitive in South Africa? Is it, are there very few universities offering it or are there a lot of universities offering it? Um, what are the level of competition like? It's quite um a lot of competition because we only have one faculty in the whole of south africa that teaches veterinary science um and i think i think they're taking about 150 to 200 a, a year only the problem is there's now a worldwide shortage of it because a lot of it's are leaving the profession um because of the stress um associated with it so uh, you'll look in in all the um like the small ads and you see that a bit is needed uh, everywhere you open your mailbox, there's about 10 different advertisements for vets. And then we get the ones from the UK and Australia and New Zealand as well. If you graduate in South Africa as a vet, what other countries can you work in? Yes, our neighbouring countries, we can. Um, I like Namibia, Botswana and Zimbabwe. We can work in the whole of the UK and also New Zealand and Australia. Load shedding. Please, can you explain what that's all about for anybody who's never heard of it? Um, load shedding is because of our um, electricity supplier not really doing the maintenance of all the big sub our old our big uh, power stations. One whole power station would go offline, and what they do instead of having the whole country in the dark um, to save power, they switch off parts for two hours to four hours at a time, and that's load shedding. It's a complete an ache if I can put it that way. <laughs> South Africans are very adaptable, I must say. We make fun of it and, and we get on with it, but it, it can be quite a pain, especially if you're busy with with a, a surgery, in the middle of the surgery and, and lights go off. The bigger hospitals thankfully have inverters and generators, but we don't. A lot of small businesses are going out of business because you know sometimes you have no power for six to 12 hours a day, which is a long time. That was horrendous. It is horrendous. And then our uh, traffic lights also don't work. I don't know how you'd cope with that. I mean, that would try most people in the UK over the edge. Most most vets oh. that cope with that would be driven over the edge. Of course, yes. We get uh, students from, let's say, Belgium and Germany. I mean, that's unheard of in Germany. And they are completely amazed that we don't have traffic lights. Now, why is the traffic light switched off as well? It's like... <laughs> what are the challenges? Do you face out there, Karen, apart from load shedding and rabies and venomous snakes? Cultural differences, I would say. Um, a lot of our indigenous people have very long standing cultural beliefs that are very difficult to explain as um, it's almost like a religion for them. So, for instance, they would believe that an owl sitting on your house at night will bring death because it flies so silently. Yes and then they might kill the owl. So it's it's very difficult to explain to people who believe this that it's wrong. And a lot of people, again, with the snakes as well, they believe that they're evil and all sorts of fun things and they kill them. Bats, they believe they carry rabies. In South Africa, our bats don't have rabies. It's more of a US problem. Um, and they get nailed a bit. Um, okay. So challenges are mostly, I think, because of people and urbanization. 
Um, we are now building over everything and anything that we can. And all our wildlife, some of them do well in urban areas and some just don't. And they, they disappear. How would you describe, Karen, the, the wildlife sector in veterinary medicine today? Are more people wanting to go into it? Fewer people? Is it growing? Is it? Is there a lot of science being done? There's a lot of science being done on it, um, especially the larger wildlife, um, because that's where most vets want to um, work. Um, because you see these videos of people doing or a YouTube or TV of an elephant and it's so fun and then uh, people in a helicopter and they're darting, which is great, but it doesn't happen every single day for these. Most large wildlife vets actually have a normal day job. They do production animals, small animals, and then in between they do to pay the bills and then in between they do wildlife things. So I, I can tell you every single vet that I've ever had, student, will always want to be a wildlife vet because of things they see on TV. But then when they actually get to do the real thing, they understand that it's not this fancy dream. We always just run around with, and help animals and, you know, in the bush. And it's wonderful. Some of it is that, but some of it is not. You know, sometimes you have to deal with uh, the people who kill the elephant that broke out of the reserve, you know, and went into their um, cornfields, for example. You know? So... It's that is part of being a wildlife vet as well. How do you see it developing over the next 10 years, Karen? More people realizing actually this is harder than it looks. Hey, I must say, I think, hmm, as I think about it, they're probably going to be a bit more, but not a massive amount. But I, we do have a lot of foreign interest as well because everybody wants to work with wildlife. It's a very small niche, if I can put it that way. So it can only carry so many wildlife vets. There's not enough work for people wanting to do large wildlife um, and that's the problem what's the situation with foreign vets coming to south africa is it a very popular destination uh because of the the wildlife are you getting more foreigners and where do they come from yes we get a lot of foreigners we've had people from germany spain belgium the czech republic lots from the uk the problem is if you're a foreigner and you want to work in South Africa, you have to do our final year exams and you also do have to do our community service year, which is a whole year that you work for the government. Um, so, And then you get placed where the, it's rural or a, um, um, a slaughterhouse or you do health checks on cattle. You know, it depends on where you are placed. Um, but they get paid very, very well, better than most other things. Um, but unfortunately, it, it's a bit of an off-putting thing for a foreign vet who wants to come work here. What's the most endangered species you work with, Karen? The pangolin. The pangolin. pangolin. Karen, is there anything that you'd like to add? Sounds like it's a terrible place full of rabies and no power. And I would never um, leave South Africa for another country. I love living here. I love South African people. We are really adaptable. We see the funny in a lot of things because you, if you cry, it'll be... You know, you'll cry forever. Um, we do tend to help each other a lot. Um, we're a friendly nation. Few places in the world can say that they have the diversity of wildlife that we do. Even with our challenges, you can make it work if you wanted to. <laughs> Karen, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you. You're the owner and the founder of the Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital. Thank you very much for being on the Practical Animal channel, Karen Lawrence.
find to show them. I don't know if they have it at this age already. And their boobs are. Have you seen? It? They have the nipples are on the side. Yeah, here. The poos are also looking very nice. Okay. I really like the sweat. No, I can do one leg at a time. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Hold this one for me for a sec. Thank you. Yeah? Yeah. Pretend that you're interested. <laughs> Doesn't have to be long love. He's just um you can stop. It's gonna be all added together. Um so it's a like a YouTube video. I did an interview.